On June 5, 1969, the mighty Russian Tupolev Tu-144 passenger jet first went supersonic, beating the British Aircraft Corporation legendary Concorde's first supersonic flight of March 2nd of that same year by four months. So then as we all know, the Tupolev was the first commercial airplane to go supersonic, and the Concorde was second, right? Actually wrong, that's not the case at all. Because what you may not know is that eight years before either of these aircrafts first achieved supersonic speeds back in 1961, in a much less publicized event and in a much less sexy airplane, the first recorded supersonic speed by a commercial jetliner was actually accomplished by an aircraft that went on to rule the skies for decades and can occasionally still be seen flying overhead even to this very day. As a matter of fact, the first commercial plane to break the sound barrier was a plane that many of you and your families may have flown back in the day. The day a Douglas DC-8 went supersonic is next on Maximus. Greetings everybody, Maximus here. I hope you're all doing well wherever you may be all around this great big world of ours. So in much the same way as I found out about the time a brand new Boeing 707 had three engines literally fall off in midair, I came upon today's story. I'll post a link to the 707 video for those of you that may not have seen it yet. While doing research for a future video, I came across a rather remarkable little nugget about the DC-8. As a matter of fact, much like Tex Johnston's famous barrel roll over Lake Washington in 1955 with the Boeing-80 which went on to become the 707, the DC-8's attempt at defeating the speed of sound in a commercial aircraft also came about for the same reasons. It was all about selling airplanes. A note before we start to get ahead of some comments sure to come. In this video, I'm not comparing military and commercial aircraft. Of course, military aircraft have been flying supersonic since 1947 when Chuck Yeager was the first to punch through the sound barrier in the Bell X-1. This video is about commercial aircraft specifically used for carrying passengers. The Douglas DC-8, sometimes referred to as the McDonnell Douglas DC-8, is a six-across seating, single-aisle, narrow-body airliner built by the American Douglas Aircraft Company. Much like the 707, the DC-8 was initially envisioned as an Air Force mid-air refueling tanker. However, after losing the May 1954 U.S. Air Force tanker competition to Boeing's KC-135 based on the 707 airframe, in July of 1955, Douglas announced its new jetliner project concept also based on their military tanker design. The first DC-8 was rolled out of the Long Beach Airport in California on April 9, 1958 and flew for the first time on May 30th of that year, also receiving its FAA certification in 1958. In October of 1955, Pan American World Airways placed simultaneous orders with Boeing and Douglas for 2707s and 25 DC-8s. Towards the end of 1955, other airlines rushed to follow Pan Am's lead. By the start of 1958, Douglas had sold 133 DC-8s compared to Boeing's 150 707s. However, even though the Douglas DC-8 was a far superior aircraft in every way to the Boeing 707, you know what they say, if you're not first, you're last. Well, unfortunately for Douglas, Boeing beat them to market with the 707, thus they got all their glory as well as the early sales orders. On September 18, 1959, the DC-8 entered service with Delta Airlines and United Airlines. By March 1960, Douglas had reached their planned production rate of 8 DC-8s a month. Despite being the better airframe, at least in my opinion, Douglas was stubborn when it came to offering different variants of the DC-8. Despite a large number of DC-8 early models available, all used the same basic airframe, basically differing only in offering multiple engine variants. In contrast, Boeing's rival 707 offered several fuselage lengths and two wingspans. The original 144-foot 707-120, a shorter 135-foot version but with longer range, and the stretch 707-320, which at 153 feet overall had 10 feet more cabin space than the DC-8. 
Douglas's refusal to offer different fuselage sizes made it less adaptable and forced Delta and United to look elsewhere for short to medium range types. Pan Am never reordered the DC-8 and Douglas gradually lost market share to Boeing. Still, Douglas wasn't swayed. Douglas knew they had a superior aircraft. At first glance, to the untrained eye, both planes looked quite similar. The 707 had a wider wing than the DC-8, but both were six-seater, single-aisle, quadrajet designs. Both aircraft even used the same Pratt-Whitney JT-3C turbojet or Rolls-Royce engines. In 1967, Douglas merged with McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, becoming McDonnell Douglas. And in future iterations, the new McDonnell Douglas would indeed offer many different variants of their DC-8 to equally compete with the Boeing 707. Okay, now with that history lesson under our belts, we can get on to why I'm sure you came here. But first, I need to mention one more aircraft. Because I know many of you have been yelling at the computer or phone screen this whole time. What about the de Havilland Comet? Well, don't worry. I didn't forget about the Comet. Because like I said, history can be a fickle beast. And even though the 707 and the DC-8 got all the historical glory, the de Havilland Comet beat both Boeing and Douglas by six years as the very first commercially jet-engined passenger aircraft. The Comet was a groundbreaking aircraft. And were it not for a design flaw, the 707 and DC-8 would have been mere afterthoughts in the jet age. As a matter of fact, the Comet would play a big role in motivating Douglas to even attempt to try and break the sound barrier with a commercial aircraft as an effort to assure a weary public that jet travel can indeed be safe. With its first flight in 1949 in the shadow of World War II, the de Havilland Comet was the world's first commercial jet airliner. However, within a year of entering commercial service, problems started to emerge, with three comets lost within 12 months in highly publicized accidents suffering catastrophic in-flight breakups. Two of these were found to be caused by structural failures resulting from metal fatigue in the airframe, a phenomenon not fully understood at the time. The other was due to overstressing of the airframe during flight through severe weather. The Comet was withdrawn from service and extensively tested. Design and construction flaws including improper riveting and dangerous concentrations of stress around some of the square windows were ultimately identified as the source of the crashes. As a result, the Comet was extensively redesigned with oval windows, structural reinforcements and other changes. Meanwhile, rival manufacturers such as the 707 and the DC-8 heeded the lessons learned from the Comet while developing their own aircraft. Although sales never fully recovered, the improved Comet 2 and the prototype Comet 3 culminated in the redesigned Comet 4 series, which debuted in 1958, but by then the reputational damage had been done. Still, the Comet remained in commercial service until 1981. But while Boeing and Douglas were touting the reliability of the 707 and DC-8, the flying public, who were used to the relative safety of piston-driven engines, were quite hesitant and downright afraid of the oncoming jet age, especially on the heels of the highly publicized mid-air breakups of the pressurized Comet jetliner. This public perception played a big part in Tex Johnston's famous barrel roll over Lake Washington. It also led Douglas Aircraft to take it a step further to put future passengers at ease, assuring them that jet travel was indeed safe. This was a contributing factor why they made the decision to take the DC-8 to levels never before seen by any commercial aircraft, and they set out to prove what even Boeing was afraid to do. So Douglas test pilot William Magruder crafted the plan to intentionally push the DC-8 beyond the limits of any commercial aircraft before and prove to the future flying public that the DC-8 could stand up to the worst that the laws of physics had to dish out. In 1961, Douglas test pilot William M. Bill Magruder came up with the idea of attempting to fly a DC-8 faster than the speed of sound a feat that no other airliner would accomplish until the Russian Tu-144 and British and French built Concorde would achieve this eight years later in 1969. Also as a bonus, 
Magruder thought that it would also be a great chance to one-up Boeing's Darling 707, knowing at the time Boeing would never attempt the same feat with their flagship. So on August 21, 1961, pilot William Magruder, co-pilot Paul Patton, flight engineer Joseph Tomich, and flight test engineer Richard H. Edwards took a Douglas DC-8-43 tail number N96040Z with Rolls-Royce Conway 509 Turbo 9 engines to Edwards Air Force Base in California for a special test flight attempt. Magruder's plan was for the DC-8 to be the first commercial airline to break the sound barrier. Before that short test flight was over, their Douglas DC-8 would have set not one, but two world records. In a 2007 interview with Air and Space Magazine, test flight engineer Richard H. Edwards detailed the events of that day. Sadly, William Magruder couldn't be interviewed because he died of a heart attack at the very young age of 54 in September of 1977. But stick around until the end because Magruder later went on to change aviation in other ways, including the creation of one of the most storied aircraft in aviation history. But I'll also tell you about Magruder's connection to infamous Boeing test pilot Tex Johnston and another hero test pilot with the right stuff. But we'll get to that in a minute. In the interview, Richard Edwards detailed the flight. He said we took it up 10 miles to 52,000 feet. That was the first record they set that day. Even today, the highest commercial aircraft flies about 45,000 feet, and that's rare unless you're in a Gulfstream or a similar business jet. Edwards said Bill put the plane into a half-G dive and maintained about 50 pounds of push. He didn't trim it for the dive because if he did, the plane would want to pull out by itself. During the dive at about 45,000 feet, we went to Mach 1.01 for about 16 seconds. According to Edwards, getting to Mach 1.01 was the easy part, pulling out of the dive. That raised the pucker factor by a bunch. The recovery was a little scary, he said. When Magruder pulled back on the yoke in the first attempt to pull out of the dive, the elevators didn't respond at all. So Magruder said, well, I'll use the stabilizer. But when Magruder tried to trim the stabilizer, again, nothing. Magruder said the stabilizer wouldn't run. So then because of the extreme load on the aircraft, it stalled. So what Magruder did next is something that no other pilot would have done, Edward said. He pushed the nose over into the dive even more, which eventually relieved the load on the stabilizer. He was finally able to run the stabilizer mode with the relieved load and recovered at about 35,000 feet. After that, it was smooth sailing all the way into the record books. Edwards said we set the supersonic record, payload record, and of course an altitude record for a commercial transport. I think it took about 10 years for the SSTs to beat that, Edwards said. A lot of pre-flight planning took place long before they ever left the ground that day. They had to determine the pushover load factor in the dive angle to be sure they got to Mach 1.1 at a rather high altitude. The speed of sound at that altitude isn't 700 miles per hour, it's less, somewhere around 667 miles per hour. The aerodynamics department prepared a set of charts. The Mach number itself isn't used in a dive as a target because it's much more accurate to use airspeed. So every thousand feet, I would read off to Bill the airspeed he needed at the next altitude. As we were coming down, I was talking almost the entire time because at a descent rate of 500 feet per second, every two seconds we were a thousand feet lower. Edward said he eventually stopped looking out the window because it looked like it was going straight down. However, the night before the record-setting test flight, near tragedy almost scrapped the project entirely. The night before the flight took off from Edwards, a tug apparently rammed into the DC-8 and damaged the leading edge slats on the wings, rendering them inoperable. That meant they were going to have to take off with the flaps up. This also meant that they wouldn't be able to control the airplane if they lost an engine. So now they had a decision to make. Do we go or not? Magruder said, hell yeah, we're going to go. We can take off with no flaps and the airplane will be all right. If we don't lose an engine, that is. Man, you gotta love test pilots. Magruder basically told Edwards, hold my beer. So they took off with the flaps up and the rest is history. When Edwards was asked what it felt like going supersonic, 
He said, well, the sensation wasn't there at Mach 101. At 96, it buffeted for a while. And a little above 96, it went away. It came back as we slowed down to 96. The thing that impressed me the most, he said, was the dark black sky up at 52,000 feet. I've never seen anything like it, but I'm sure our military pilots are familiar with it. I had mounted some cameras in the middle of the airplane, he said, shooting out of each window. I wanted to catch the F-100 and the F-104 chase planes out there. But I never saw the chase planes in the pictures. But it did show the ailerons flapping up as the shock wave passed over us. I think it happened at about 0.97. They went up about 5 degrees, and then he added, on both sides, fortunately. Edwards said they were never frightened, just happy they accomplished what they set out to do, making aviation history in the process. The test aircraft, tail number N9604Z, was delivered to Canadian Pacific Airlines, where she served for nearly 19 years until 1980. Sadly, no one thought to preserve the plane for history. Finally, it was sold for scrap in 1980. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find much information about any of the other crew members anywhere. However, there is quite a bit of history and lore on Captain William Magruder. Much like old Tex Johnston, Magruder looked every bit of what you imagine a test pilot to look like. Oh, and speaking of Tex Johnston, some of my, shall we say, more mature subscribers may remember a radio legend by the name of Paul Harvey. He used to have a radio segment he called The Rest of the Story. Well, as he used to say, now we're all about to hear the rest of the story. It's no accident that William Bill Magruder had the right stuff of a fighter pilot, because before he was a test pilot for Douglas, he actually flew with none other than Alvin Tex Johnston on the B-52 development program. Oh, and remember the chase planes Edwards was trying to get a picture of as the DC-8 broke the sound barrier? Well, the man flying the Lockheed F-104 was a name you may have heard of before, a young test pilot by the name Chuck Yeager. Yeah, that Chuck Yeager. Magruder's father was Major General Bruce M. Magruder, a member of John J. Pershing's staff in World War I. He was born in 1923. He began flying in World War II in what was then the Army Air Corps. After the war, Magruder received an aeronautical engineer degree from the University of California and then joined the Air Force, serving from 1949 to 56 as Task Force Commander of the B-52 Test Program, where he was awarded the Legion of Merit. From 1956 to 63, Mr. Magruder was with the Douglas Aircraft Company, then with Lockheed Aircraft in California until 1971 when President Richard Nixon tapped him to head the Federal U.S. Supersonic Transport or the SST project in 1971. But while Magruder was at Lockheed, he developed another one of my all-time favorite planes, the sleek and sexy three-engine wide-body jetliner, the Lockheed L-1011, to compete head-to-head -head with Boeing's new 747 jumbo jet. The L-1011 was the first commercial airliner equipped with the ability to auto land. Before Magruder's death, he was executive vice president of Piedmont Airlines. If being a test pilot isn't the coolest profession on earth, I don't know what is. So how about that? So many storylines surrounding a man most of us probably never heard of. That being William Bill Magruder. I'm anxious to hear how many of you may have known about him. And how many of you may have heard his amazing story. Hey, if you're one of the nearly 800,000 people that saw my video on the 707, let me know down below. I think both these stories have a similar feel-good aspect to them. Well, that's all I have for now. Thanks for joining me. And as usual, on your way out, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment, and ring that bell. And remember, leave the rubber on the runway and your troubles on the ground. And I will see you next time in the air. Yeah, this Maximus.